What's going to happen with the NBN now that the Liberals are in power? We have a teaser about IBC, but more on that later. And it's Black Betty time, Bambalam. A Girl and a Gun, episode 21, recorded the 19th of September 2013. Black Betty, Bambalam. Hello and welcome to A Girl and a Gun, the show for filmmakers and content creators. I am Phil Moore, and if you think this eye looks bad, you should see the other fellow. And <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> That's, yes, a burst blood vessel. A burst blood vessel. As shown on high-definition television. It's like, you yes. know, Phil in all his glory with the eyes. Yes, it'll, it'll clear up in a couple of weeks, but for today's show, yeah. I'm stuck with a, a bung on Okay. It. So, try not to look so we're not going to make fun about this. We're not going to do a South Park thing. No, we've just done it. That's out of the way. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you saw it, and you, if you saw it, you realised what it was. Next. <laughs> Next. Uh, we're going to try and zip through today's episode because there's, uh, there's not that much news to get but to. But it's been a very exciting week technically because well, the, yes. we, we have, we, we've just in the throes of um, the IBC show finishing. Um, it finished, I think, yesterday as we record this. And... Uh, we're not recording for the next two weeks, so you can expect that in about three weeks we're going to do a pretty good technical wrap. I noticed that Ross has done a whole heap of releases because uh, they kept. Well, hang on, you're you're, in, me on you're into it already. Let's oh, run yeah, the yeah, news but, bumper. But look, we'll come back to it later. <laughs> yeah, as he said. Let's run the news bumper. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, as you say, yeah. IBC's been happening, and yeah. we do have a couple of stories from there, but there's a lot more coming out. Well, it was yeah. just it was just in relation to you saying <laughs> there wasn't any news. There's some news. There is, but we haven't We're got it all not yet. It We're this not, week. We haven't got it all yet. Yeah. We're not. We haven't a chance to look at it all, yeah. and it's still happening as we speak, basically. It's always happening. Uh, what has been happening this week? Um, as we know, the Liberals won the federal election. And there was... Oh, that was a surprise? That, well, not much of a surprise. But as we know, um, from our point of view, from our industry's point of view, the NBN has been a big topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. The Labor plan versus what the Liberals are planning on doing with theirs, which is the fibre to the node rather than fibre to the home. Um, there is a petition for those who would rather see the original Labor plan kept in force. Uh, and you'll find this at change.org e, um, petitions. Uh, for the Liberal Party of Australia to reconsider their plan and to keep the original Labor Party plan. Um, it's got so far 254,000, they're aiming for 300,000, but already Malcolm Turnbull has said, I don't care about your petition, we're doing it, we've got a mandate. Yeah, and that's a really interesting thing. It's like, hello, we've got a mandate to change government, therefore we're going to do exactly what we want, even though it might or might not be the best thing to do. And look, I, I feel I feel for Malcolm Turnbull, because no matter what he believes privately, and I think the, the original theory of going fibre to the node and, and crap to the home was not a terribly good idea, and he spent a lot of time convincing his the rest of his well, party that that was the case. Mm. But, but, you know, th they've been so vocal about this, regardless of what is the right technical answer, it's going to be a political nightmare to well, I think Malcolm, um, as much as one might think he didn't really agree with that policy, the, some of the things you've been saying lately is like, really, Malcolm? Uh, anyway, he has said yeah. that he, he doesn't he doesn't care about this. Uh, he's, he's going the party line, and of course, Labor have done this in the past as well. If they win an election, they feel they've got a mandate to do everything that they su suggested. Um, this look, is a look, big I'll issue you, for I'll our give industry. You my, bet, my bet is is that fibre to the home really is the right answer. That's the, you know, my personal feeling. Yeah. Um, fibre to the node using you know bits of copper going to the home is workable. The saviour in this area will be a technology called vectoring, which might actually deliver the right result. But you know, you could just put the fibre to the home straight away. Fibre to the premises solve all the problems. Don't stuff around with interviews. Well, there's solutions. in this area, uh, uh, related to this, from the Sydney Morning Herald, there was uh, an article about concerns over the state of wiring. Uh, the Liberals, the government wants, uh, in about 60 days, they want an audit of the copper wiring network. Oh, good luck. <laughs> exactly. So uh, the network is so such a patchwork of old and new, and it's constantly being refurbished, constantly being repaired. Um, but there's an article here from the Sydney Morning Herald about this network and how much it's potentially going to cost. There is no figures. Yeah. 
Telstra have not released figures on how much it costs to repair this and, and every nobody year. Does. Nobody does. But Telstra was quoted a couple of days ago as saying, you know, the life of the copper could be anywhere from three years to 50 yeah. years. Well, 100 years. So, yeah, if it's brand new, it might last 100 years. Yeah. If it's three years or less, it's probably, well, that's due for an update. But you, it's hard to know where and when that is. But there's conflicting reports here. Chief Executive David Thode yeah. um, said earlier, the copper has been going well for 100 years. I think it'll keep going for another 100. But then there's a conflicting report from someone else. Um, Tony Warren at five minutes to midnight it'll last for up to 15 years at the most so you know who do you believe um, I, I think the truth is in there somewhere not all copper will last 100 years there are real problems with some copper and some infrastructure every time it rains you get noise on your analog phone you know there's other other infrastructure yeah, one of the arguments lines. was that a lot of this repair work is from construction sites accidentally wrecking the lines uh, backhoes yeah, yeah, which big, you big lay fibre, it's going to happen as well anyway. That won't true. make a big difference. Absolutely true. But I think if you lay new fibre, there'll be marks to say there's a line here. Here's the story, and mark my words, I'll go out on the limb. If, you've, if you're a DSL customer right now, you've got Twisted Pair coming into your home, and you're getting DSL, and you're getting better than 12 megabits, and it's consistent, your copper's fine. Right. So that's an easy test to do then, basically. Pretty much. If you're yeah. getting good, good, pro good performance on DSL, your copper's fine. Well, the trouble is, and for a lot of cities, that might be the case. Mm. But for country areas... Country notes, yes. You know, and... That's a technical term. Exactly. Part of this was to try and improve the services in country areas. And one of the reasons an independent was elected, I forget the seat now, it was down south, that they got an independent, was because partly of that communication infrastructure. That, the, you know, that was an important aspect of what she was elected on, the oh, platform. Oh, people in the country, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's a couple of core issues for that local uh, you're, you're town. You're thinking of Indi, are you? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah, well, there are other reasons for that. And one. there were others, but that yeah. was one of the things, exactly. Okay. Um, anyway, it is still an issue, even though the Liberals, now that they've won government and they were signed in yesterday as we speak, basically, uh, they're sticking to their guns. Mm. So let's see how it pans out. Let's see if there's some... Um, Happy days. And if you do want to, if you think it's going to make a difference, have a look at that petition on change.org. If you want to try and continue the Labor plan, see if you can change their minds. Anyway, moving right along, just a few quick things. There has been a study into uh, crowdfunding. Um, this is coming from Screen Hub. The government is reviewing equity investment modelling crowdfunding. Now, you hope, that sounds like, oh, great. Crowdfunding for feature films, they're looking into the tax, in, you know, you can claim it as a donation. No, no, none of that's happening. So it's not a big story, but they're starting to look into it. They're starting to take it seriously. Uh, in terms of film production, it doesn't make a big deal of difference yet. <laughs> there we go. That was. No, I just love the page that comes up and says, this is available to members only. Well, yeah, for Screen Hub, yes, you do need to be a member of Screen Hub to read some of these articles, which is why I sort of mentioned them, uh, so you don't have to if you're not. Uh, they're looking into online-based funding to gauge community interest in a project. So uh, when you... When you uh, so, uh, donate to Possible or Kickstarter, one of these. Is it a donation? Is it an investment? Can you write it off as a tax deduction? Not yet. Not currently. Even if it's a donation, you can't. Yeah, well, from, from my way of thinking, if you could get into um, you know, something better than a Ponzi scheme <laughs> where, where you were actually investing in a film and that would be claimable as a tax deduction, mm. then another form of film funding, if it's legitimate, should also be claimable as a tax deduction. Yeah. John's, One would think so. John's simplistic thinking. So they're starting to look into it, but it's not making a big deal of difference yet. Uh, Screen New South Wales have announced $1.5 million investment uh, into a new round of investments. Just alerting you, there's uh, three new adult TV dramas, three new TV shows, five factual series and two one-off docos. Quite a lot for $1.5 million, actually. Um, yeah, it's a huge that, it may not that be the total budget for these productions, but it's an investment from Screen New South Wales. 30000 of it. Uh, there are three $30,000 grants going to some emerging filmmakers. So, good. There's some funding going out there to, to a few people. Uh, I wish it was more, but $1.5 million is now been, being handed out for some productions, which is great. And it looks like there's quite a few things there on the cards. Thank you, Screen New South Wales. And congratulations to those who got some money. Yeah. Good if you got the dosh. <laughs> um, a, a, a recent production. Did you see Jane Campion's uh, miniseries, Top of the Lake? No. Uh, it was quite good, quite good. I saw it. It's been nominated for a number of Emmy Awards recently. It didn't win most of them, but it did win for cinematography. Best cinematography in a TV series. Just the fact that it was even nominated for Emmy Awards. Mm. That's, that's a tight fun. Yeah, this was the one that was shot in New Zealand and it was all set in New Zealand in this place called Sanctuary, I think it was. 
Uh, it was a kind of murder mystery, uh, quite intriguing in places. Um, she didn't win for Best Director, etc., etc. They'd won for uh, cinematography. So, yes, well done for Top of the Lake, mm -hmm. winning an Emmy. Great. Just wanted to mention that. Moving right along. Mm -hmm. Moving right along. Moving right along. A couple of weeks ago, um, we talked about Larry Lessig, who's a Harvard Law professor, an expert in copyright law, and he had this video, which goes back a few years, uh, which was shown in Korea, he, which was a speech he gave in Korea. And he used um, a song uh, demonstrating, you know, fair use rights and, and, and um, mashups and that kind of thing. The song called Listomania by the band Phoenix. And he was sued by the record label. Uh, very heavily sued. They didn't just take it down from YouTube. They contacted him directly and said, take it down. We are suing you. Bastards. All right. So they backed down. The record company have backed down. They're not suing him. But he, remember, if you remember, he was suing him right back. Yeah, yeah. And he's going to continue with that suit uh, for damages. There's probably not a lot of damages here because uh, at the most, maybe it's a couple of dollars worth of YouTube advertising funding that they, they've lost out on. But I think it's a principle oh, of thing I'm here. I'm sure there's some sort of some tort they can come up with that yeah. will compound it into a couple of squillion. He, no, so this is coming from uh, the Boston Globe. He's continuing with his lawsuit, I think, on principle. Yeah to set a precedent uh, so that people don't just go willy-nilly suing people which in what is a genuine fair use case, basically. He's, he's setting the groundwork for this. And note that everything we use on this program is fair use, whether it's fair or not, because <laughs> we're using it. There's a couple of things coming up later which we're saying, fair use, fair use. Yes. Um, still on IP, here's an interesting one. Every now and then we get stories about torrents and piracy and all that kind of thing, right? Mm. Um, there is an excellent low-budget sci-fi film called uh, Man from Earth. I've actually got this on DVD. Most of it takes place in a house. It's a it's really interesting conceptual sci-fi. Not a lot of visual effects. It's one of those mind... It's in your brain. It's in your brain. There's a lot of concepts and characters in it. Um, but it's been very popular on the torrent sites, mm. this uh, low-budget film. It goes back quite a few years now. Uh, which doesn't help the filmmakers financially, mm. being downloaded and poeted, but it's built an audience for the film. To the extent that they're thinking about making a sequel and raising the funds on Kickstarter. Mm. So, to some extent, pirating and torrenting this film has encouraged a sequel to so be made. It, it's, got, it's got enough of an audience that they feel justified in coming up with a second pass. Mm. Have they made any money out of it? That's the question. I think they would have made enough initially, you know, from DVD sales and maybe licenses to TV and whatever. Mm. Um, but they're hoping with the support the of current Kickstarter campaign for uh, a The Man From Earth sequel. We asked the filmmakers to explain how piracy boosted their film stock and why they're talking to Kickstarter. So there's an article here on IndieWives where this comes from. Mm. Um, it is a really cool film. I actually like it very much, even though it's, it's very low budget. It's nice performances. And yes, I'm, I would look forward to a sequel. I would actually support this Kickstarter if they got this up and running. Would you put in your own money? I'd put in a bit of money, even though I can't deduct it on tax. Have you ever put in any money? I have indeed. I've, I've supported a few Kickstarter things. Okay. Any of them get up? Um, let me see. There was a Zach... talking about something, something that isn't your own production. No, no, not, not my own. I haven't put anything on Kickstarter myself. The Zach Braff thing, I think I put some money into. Oh, you did? Yes. Okay. Um, there's been some tech products. I didn't do, what was that watch? I didn't do that one. But there's been a few tech products I've done. Yeah. Um, there was a musician who's a friend of mine. Um, uh, who, and I, I gave her some money towards the making of her, her album. Right. And she's touring with Cindy Lauper at the moment, right. which is Max Sharam. So I put some money towards her Kickstarter. There's been a few that I've done. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, um, it's worthwhile. If you can afford to do it, yeah. throw in $50, $100, whatever. By the way, if you're, if you're listening here, um, you, you might want to come and, and help kickstart the Soundproof the Studio project. <laughs> <laughs> we just had these noises are coming from the yeah. floor above us. Carpentry upstairs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it all happens over here in TAFE. We need a Kickstarter to upgrade our studio. Yeah. Uh, Send your money to the address <laughs> that you see on the screen right now. Do we have that lower third? Oh, it up you know, it'll be the John and Phil South America Fund. <laughs> um, IBC. Now, there are a couple of stories from I We saw it there. Yeah. Um, we have, um, I've got this from Red Shark News, actually. This is from, they're, they're coming out with a, uh, Sony coming out with a new large sensor camera. Um, and there's a story here, in fact, and I've got the wrong piece here. This is a story, in fact, by the author, uh, by a guest author. He doesn't give his name for some reason on Red Shark News. Talking about, is a large sensor in a camera really that necessary? As opposed to? As opposed to 
Small sensor cameras that are much more portable, much more all-in-one, okay. built-in lens, all yeah, of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, okay. So we know that the large sensor gives you, and i gotta, I got to say this, yeah. wafer-thin depth of field. <laughs> exactly. Wafer-thin. It, it becomes that depth of field issue, yeah. and then you've got attachments for lenses, and you have prime lenses, and yeah. it becomes this whole production. But, but of course, you, you, also get, you also get much better light performance out of a small sensor. Yeah, a, a, large, a larger sensor. Large yeah. sensor. So there's a whole heap of things the large sensor gives you, the small sensor doesn't. But what you sacrifice yeah. is efficiency to some extent, you know, um, convenience. Uh, cheapness. Cheapness. No worries about depth you know, of field. And depending on the job, the argument here is, that the reality is sometimes a small, portable, all-in-one kind of camera is fine. It's perfectly fine for the job. I just took your picture here right now. If you, you, you take one of the smaller Sony cameras. I've got to tell you, look at, look at this. This sensor here is so small. <laughs> that, that sits right there yes. in my little finger. It's wafer thin. It is. You look at some of the smaller totally, totally Sony cameras. Stop sensor. distracting me. Stop. The XD cams, the, the Panasonic P2 type cameras, which are these middle of the range cameras, they, they're perfect for certain jobs, like ENG type news and you know, documentary or even low budget films some, to some extent. Or indeed shooting this program. Oh, indeed, that's what these, this that's program shot on. Is. Being shot on Panasonic uh, Peter. So have a look at that. There's a nice arg argument there of saying don't give up on your smaller sensor, you know, more all-in-one type cameras because they can be still very useful. They have their advantages. Okay, on to IBC. Ari Alexa released a whole heap of new, new things over there. Um, this is just a taste of what's coming in future weeks when we come back after our break. Um, They've released a baby version of their camera. There's the XT and the XR cameras. Um, and they now support what is called SanDisk 2.0, CFast 2.0. So there's a new high-speed card that they can use. 300 and mega, me, 350 megabytes per second. Megabytes. Megabytes, not megabytes. bits. That's pretty important because mm. if you're, you, you think about high definition, um, uncompressed high definition, you're talking one and a half megabits. Um, as you moved into higher resolutions, you're talking about three megabits or six, sorry, three gigabits, six gigabits, one and a yeah. half gigabits. I got the wrong year. There, <laughs> yeah, that was good. So what was it you were talking about? The same distance so, 300 and what? 60 gig and 120 gig capacities. Yeah, yeah, but what? 350 is, megabytes a second. 350 megabytes right speed. means it will probably sustain about two and a half gigabits right. a second. They're still talking, this is compressed though. No, so, no, that's, that's if you're storing on the media, who cares? Yeah, but yeah, um, but they're still talking ProRes and, and DNX uh, compressed formats okay. for this. But yes, super fast cards, yeah. nice and big capacity. Uh, memory's getting faster and bigger as we go. For flash storage, that's actually pretty pretty amazing. That's, well, and it also, that's even though it's compressed like ProRes 4444 4, 4, 4, up to 20, 100, 120 frames a second, it'll handle the high frame rates yeah. now, things like that. A lot better. What, whatever, you, whatever you could do in somewhere between two and three gigabits a second. Yeah. Um, also from Ari, pro this is interesting, an RGB um, motion scene camera, they're calling it. Mm. So basically what it is, is a regular RGB camera with a Z-axis, right? So there's metadata that records what happens in that 3D Z-axis. Um, which means in post, you can alter the focus, you can alter the depth of field, um, all these sorts of things, even though you've basically got a 2D image in RGB. This is interesting. This is sort of going further down the intelligent camera yeah. um, stuff, like, like all the stuff that's been coming out of Stanford University. And the, so a, a smarter camera, Franken camera, research. Franken camera that's even more so designed for post-production and visual effects work and things like to integrate the live action with whatever CG you might be doing and to take that metadata that Z -axis, and make that fit into your 3D program, bang, there you go, it all just fits. I'm, I'm sure that makes, makes things a lot easier. To make lighting and focus in your focus. CG world fit the real world, things like that, it would be perfect for. Right. So that's on the way. Um, that's it. That's, that's the, the bulk of our news. I've got a couple of other pieces, so, but that's so the, the main news. Something, something caught my eye from um, IBC release. Yeah. So I, I started to say before Ross. So Ross just mail dropped me something like crazy, <laughs> you know, like anybody who was on their list. But um, Ross is turning out just an, uh, just an ever improving, ever cheapening range of switches. And, and I shouldn't say cheap because that's not really a good word. They're just incredibly cost effective. And you're talking about hardware that would have cost you half a million dollars 10 or 15 years ago is now being delivered for like 25K. Mm. Well, 
they came out with a really cute announcement at IBC, a thing called, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure they came up with this title after a lot of thought, a mini ME, mini mix effects, but like, it mini me. Like mini me. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. The it mini me. And this is um, this is like an element that you can apply in the switcher anywhere in the program path in the switcher to do something you don't need to do all the time. So you think about you might have a, a switcher that has say four keys on a mix effects row, mm -hmm. and that would let you set up say you know here's your picture and you go person 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 person. So you do the squeezes in the keys, squeeze yeah. and position in the keys. Now you need to fly them off just in that particular shot. So you could take this mini ME thing and apply it to just that, and once you've done that move, you can use it somewhere else in the switcher. Okay, this is did an area- I, Did I just confuse you You did, thoroughly? because it's an area I don't deal a lot Good. with. Good, I love <laughs> it. For people who are doing television mm. and, and just want to be able to have maximum amounts of power, this is really oh. cute stuff. Right. Really innovative. Tell us more when you've got more and you've got some pictures to go well, with it. Well, you know, like if, yeah. somebody, if somebody from Ross is watching this and they're going to be really smart, how about you just drop a carbonite in for us to play with for a couple of weeks <laughs> and we'll tell everybody Yeah, about any bit of, bit of gear that we can actually have here and have a play with, have yeah, a look at and work. show and tell, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but there will be more from IBC, uh, as we say. Once when, we, we, when we come back when after we come the back, We'll have break, a whole heap we'll, of things. Yeah, we will. Got a couple of interesting things just to wrap up our news with. Um, from What Culture, there's an article here on eight great movies about filmmaking that all directors must see. Eight great movies about filmmaking. About filmmaking. So some of these are documentaries. The, the, there's The Snowball Effect, which is about the making of uh, Kevin Smith's Clerks. Uh, you know, These are almost certainly going to be movies that indie. I've never seen. You've never seen Clerks? No. Okay, we've got to see that one. C-L-E-R-K-S? Yeah. No. Um, no Heart of Darkness, which is uh, the one about the making of Apocalypse Now. Okay, I haven't seen that. Oh, got to see the document. Have you not seen Apocalypse Now? I haven't seen Apocalypse Now. Oh, my now. God. Watch Apocalypse Now. I saw now. the sequel, which was Apocalypse Now. But no, that was, okay. no, no. And Heart of Darkness, which is an awesome documentary about the disaster that that film was in production, and yet it came out a classic. Okay. Uh, you know, it drove everyone around the bend drove Francis Ford Coppola nearly mad, basically trying to get the thing made. Um, narrative film adaptation, which is about a filmmaker, a writer trying to write his script. I'm just going to zip through them here. Yeah. Um, Sunset Boulevard, again, about a writer, famously. Mm. Uh, most famously for the opening scene where he starts dead, but he's narrating the story, <laughs> basically. <laughs> One of my favourites, Lost in La Mancha, which is about Terry Gilliam trying to make The Man of La Mancha. And the disaster, it never got finished. Oh. And this is the documentary about their attempt. He's tried this several times, his attempt to make this film. All sorts of things go wrong with it. It's one of his, and Terry Gilliam, unfortunately, has had a few of these ill-fated projects. Baron Munchausen was another one that did get finished, but yeah, it was yeah, yeah. by the but skin like, of his teeth. But he's also got these ones that did make it, like Brazil. Yeah, which was troubled, but got made and is a classic of its kind. Yeah. Um, Lost in La Mancha looked like it could have been great. They did get to shooting some of it, but then they had to stop part way through. There's all these productions on, all these costumes were made. They were out in the desert shooting, and then various things went wrong. Weather, accidents with the lead actor, all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Starting to sound, sound a bit more like, you know, like an Ed Wood thing. It almost was. David Holtzman's Diary, which is a film I've never seen, so I've got to chase that one up, actually. Uh, I don't Speaking know anything which, about that. Was Ed that. Wood on the list? No, that would be a good one for the list, actually. It's a great one it, for the that list. That would be a good one to add to this list, a film about filmmaking and how maybe not to make the worst film known in history. Yeah. Uh, one of the best films of this kind, Day for Night, the Truffaut film. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's been a classic of its kind for many years. And top of their list is uh, a documentary called American Movie, which is about a couple of guys trying to make an indie horror film, an American horror film, and this is a saga of you know, trying to get the funding and trying to get the thing made, low budget horror filmmaking. One that's not on this list, which I would add personally, um, is an Australian documentary called Making Venus from a few years ago now, about some Australian indie filmmakers trying to do the same thing to make, um, it was a kind of an erotic thriller or something. Uh, not, the documentary not a genre that we're actually known for very often no. in this country, is it? It, it? But the documentary about the disaster of their making was much better than the original film, which did get finally finished. And they made all sorts of mistakes, like saying to the rich uncle or something, I will guarantee you 
I can get your money back to you if you invest in our film. You never guarantee a return on investment. You, you might can't. if it was a rich uncle. <laughs> but then all the family came down on them. It's like, mm. you know, where's our money? You guaranteed it. Things like that. Uh, making Venice, an Australian making a film about Turned that kind it into of thing. A murder mystery. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to finish this with um, a really cool video that's been doing the rounds. It's been a bit viral lately, so you may have seen this one. Uh, this comes from IndieWire again. Don't blink or you'll miss the aging in this short. Uh, if we can run a bit of that video and I'll just talk over the top of it. Have you got it there, guys? So this is uh, a very simple video of a, a head of a, a, a young Chinese girl or Asian girl. And it, uh, it just ages her through an entire life in five minutes flat. Uh, so, so subtly that you don't even notice that, you know, that she's growing old. Anyway, have a look for it, IndieWire.com, and just do a search for Don't Blink or You'll Miss the Aging in This Short Animated Still Photo. Very well done. Uh, as I say, it's five minutes long, and you can zip through it and you can see it. But if you just watch it, it's seamless. Very nicely done. Uh, that's basically it for the news of this week. Anything you want to add there? How much more <clears throat> can I possibly add? <laughs> How much more can you possibly add? I'm going to throw one other fine little thing in, <clears throat> which is not in our lineup. I discovered this last night. I was watching Breaking Bad the, this week, the final, well, not the final, but this week's episode. We're getting very close to the end. On Arts Beats uh, blogs, NewYorkTimes.com, uh, just do a search for at Arts Beats, and there's a video Brian Cranston, Vince Gilligan, the creator of the series, and others on the end of Breaking Bad. We've got two more episodes to go, I think. Uh, there's a one and a half hour conference, uh, Q&A with audience. I've yet to watch the whole thing. I've been saving it. Uh, but if you're into Breaking Bad, have a look at this. It's on Arts Beats uh, on the NewYorkTimes.com website. And by the way, another two programs ended in Australia this week. So we've just had the last episode of The Newsroom for season two. Really good but, series, But yeah. they've announced, um, Showtime has announced, or Showcase, one of them, mm -hmm. has announced that season three will be turning up in 2014. So, so it's, it's been successful enough now to, to be extended into another season, and show, so it should be. Yeah, definitely. Um, Aaron Sorkin, the writer and creator of that series. The, the story arc for series yeah. two was just breathtaking. No, it really was. Brilliant. I mean, Breaking Bad, we are inundated with brilliant TV series the, and well-written shows at the moment. The other one, and I don't know whether this classifies as brilliant TV or well-written, but it's interesting, is Under the Dome. I've heard about this. I've been avoiding it, to be honest. We've, we've been watching it. We, we've got about three episodes still sitting in the box to get to. Mm. Um, it's originally a Stephen King yeah. horror story, which ended. But for television purposes, it can't end. It has to be drawn out. And um, lots of moral dilemmas, lots of technical dilemmas they haven't really dealt with yet. Um, and it appears that they're winding that up and getting ready for another season. Really? And that's interesting. Yeah, I've basically uh, heard it's not very good, but just good enough to keep you watching. <laughs> um, it's not very good, but it's just good enough to keep you watching. Oh, that's where I heard it. Yeah, it might okay. have been. I don't think I said it. Somebody else. But it's, look, it's an interesting premise. But right now, you've got people who are trapped under a dome. Nothing gets in. Nothing gets out. They can't dig under it. Wasn't that so, the Simpsons movie? So, <laughs> sooner or later, you know, they're going to run out of fuel, oxygen, and a few other things. And turn into um, with The Walking Dead or something. But who knows? Because in the middle of this is an egg. An egg. And, okay. And, yeah. Well, there's a lot of great shows on with excellent writing. Uh, we have actually now our last episode in our series on writing, as it happens, with Karel Seegers. Let's roll that now. Hello, and welcome to our next instalment in our series on screenwriting with Karel Seegers. Hello, Karel. Hello, Phil. Now, for this one, we've talked about characters, screenplays, um, structure. We've touched on subtext, but I want to know a bit more about subtext. And we talked about scene writing. We didn't really talk about dialogue much. No, though. that's right. And um, it's, in a, it's almost a subject that I wanted to avoid because everybody, everybody pays so much attention to it anyway. You know, that's all writers want to write is dialogue. Uh, admitted, it helps when you write your first draft to just write the whole story, in most, most of it in dialogue, and then later externalize it. Because if you write everything in dialogue, what you're writing is TV drama, it's like daytime drama. Mm. It's not always very interesting, it's on the nose. 
And our interaction in, in everyday oh, real sorry, life... I know what you mean, but just to explain for people out there, on the nose. On the nose means that characters are exactly saying what they mean, and it's boring. In real life, that doesn't happen, you know? If, um, say, if, I, if I'm not too happy about the subject, I'd much rather have been talking about, um, you know, asparagus here, then um, I, I would tell you, uh, or I'd be very polite and say it in a roundabout way. Right? So as you said in an earlier, people don't tend to tell the truth. They don't. Characters they don't. lie. Characters yeah. hide what they're really yeah, wanting to that's say. That's right. And it's in the real in the real world too. When mm. there are big issues, we don't say them. We don't confront people because we're afraid of that. So in movies, we've got to be real. You know, it's, it's got to feel real. Therefore, that sort of, sort of stuff stays in the subtext, in the body language. You know, if I would start uh, explaining stuff really quickly to you, then it's not necessarily because I speak like that. Maybe I'm in a hurry. Maybe or maybe I'm, you're trying to get all the, the exposition out of the way. <laughs> may, yeah, maybe. Or maybe I have an appointment where I need to go. That's the subtext, but the audience needs to know about that. Mm. And the, the reader needs to know about that. So subtext is what the scene is really about. And I think, uh, I think someone said at some point, if the scene is about what the scene is about, mm. you're in deep shit. Yeah. Which means that if there's only one layer to it, right? So you can have characters talk about something, but if that's it, then that's not And any movie. good actor given a script like this, the first thing they look for is, what's the subtext? What am I really trying to do and, here? And, and what am I doing? Mm. While we have this conversation, what am I doing? You know, what is the action that I have to give, you know, to be busy? One I'm of the best examples of this for me was like the Robert Redford film, Ordinary People, mm -hmm. and the scene where Mary Tyler Moore is making breakfast. Yeah. And she's just making yeah. breakfast. And there yeah. is a tension, oh, yeah. enormous tension under this Absolutely. scene. The action, physical yeah. action is, Pretty mundane, well, and well, the dialogue is pretty mundane. Well, I'd say the, the the action is not mundane. The dialogue is mundane. If you would read the dialogue, that's just a breakfast scene. Mm. But you look at how this this mother interacts with her family. There's something really wrong about yeah. that. So and we know. And she's what trying it is. to hide it and failing. That's right. <laughs> that's it. So subtext is what we see. What is what is there? Um, a Sydney screenwriter uh, wrote a short film a few years ago and she did this uh, experiment. She sends around the dialogue of her script, just the dialogue. She says, oh. <laughs> guess what it is about? Nobody guessed it because she had done her job properly. The dialogue was about, you know, again, some morning mm -hmm. scene, very mundane, but the subtext in the description was, was really interesting. It was about um, a suspected terrorist. Uh, but it was not in the dialogue. Dialogue. Sounded. In fact, if you get a scene like that, you could play it many different ways, yeah. Uh, yeah. and the subtext can still be valid. Yeah. The dialogue is not that important; it's how you play it. Yeah. One question here, though. Uh, going back to your first point, yes, a lot of screenwriters overdo the dialogue. Too much words, and there's a good rule that we don't write too much dialogue. However, there are exceptions. Kevin Smith, Quentin Tarantino, um, uh, Aaron Sorkin, great dialogue writers. How do we justify, how do they get away with writing such big verbal dialogue yeah. scenes? You've got to do what you're good at, you know, and if you're good at writing dialogue, then use it. Uh, Aaron Sorkin, he got his skill from listening to uh, hundreds and hundreds of plays when he was a kid. He went to the theatre all the time, so he, he got a really good ear for dialogue, but his dialogue, again, it, 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 it's always uh, a perfect uh, complement to what's happening in the scene. I gave this example from the, the movie Charlie Wilson's War. That's Aaron Sorkin. That's right. Aaron Sorkin. Yeah. And it was all about a subtext. The dialogue was about, um, uh, sorry, here, th th he flipped it. He did the opposite. It was fantastic. So the dialogue uh, was the exposition. The dialogue was what we needed to know, yeah. but the subtext made it more interesting. The subtext was, was the drama and the dialogue was the exposition. And in fact, that's a good lesson to how to get across exposition, which you've got to tell the audience, but you've got to do it as gracefully as possible. Put some kind of conflict, put something else in there that you get the information out, yeah. but there's always something else that's keeping it interesting. Always keep it multi-layered. Mm. And um, I said two things, you know, you have the dialogue and then you have the subtext or the, or the character behavior, the body language in contradiction with that. Ideally, see if you can add a third layer. For your really big scenes, you can have a third thing going on. So subtext is the key for any good screenplay, would you say? It's where the story happens. It's where the real story happens. It's what this movie's really about. That's right. Right. Carol Seegers, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we hope to get a bit more advanced with these in the future, but for now, that's the end of this series. Thank you very much, Carol.
Okay, there we go. That's the last in our series with Corel. We've got to get a few more tutorials lined up for next turn now. Um, we also now have, we have a pick my brain question. So let's run that bumper. Pick my brain. Pick my brain. And what's the question? What's Phil? the question? Is there a, a camera, camera available, available that you can, you can edit, edit on? on? That's becoming the new way of doing things. A lot of um, modular cameras where you can do more than just shoot. We can uh, edit and upload and all sorts of things on them. The Black Magic is trying to do a bit of that. Um, but Th there are lots of cameras where you can trim in and out points, but I don't think that's what the question is asking about. Um, I think what they're referring to, they may have heard of this thing called the Black Betty. The Black Betty camera, yeah. which is designed, it's, it's not so much a camera as an enclosure with a whole lot of stuff going into it. It is. Uh, there, there we are. We've got it the pictures up there now. It doesn't look like a movie camera, but it's not. Yeah. yeah. Inside is basically um, uh, a mini, an Apple Mac mini computer. So it really is a computer in a box. And because it's a full-on Apple Mac Mini, you can edit there on editing software, whatever editing software you want, yeah. I presume, on it. And with Wi-Fi, I presume, upload directly to the web, all of that sort of thing. It's a pretty bizarre concept, isn't it? A high-quality camera that has enough compute power built into it that you just go and do, literally do field editing. This is the kind of thing that ENG, field documentary people, I can, I can up until it. now, yeah, you, you've got a camera and you take a laptop and you download to this and, and try to... So you're having to take at least two or three bits with you to try and edit stuff in the field. And so the, the question is, is it better to have a single device? Like, you could do this. Yes, it's a clever idea. Mm. Is it going to lead to better productivity or does it just lead to a single device that fails and leaves <laughs> you with nothing? Look, by the look of it, it's a bigger than average camera. Um, I think as a computer, for editing purposes, it'll be fine. You'll like, still need a screen, though. Where's the screen on this thing? There's no monitor, so you have to plug a monitor into it. Look, look through the viewfinder. Through the viewfinder. What is the chip like? What is the lens like? You'll need a, you'll need a camera, uh, a keyboard. So here's the keyboard, and you'll need a rodent. Yes, so you'll need to, do that. and there is a, um, you can see that one of the pictures there shows a monitor, a, a viewing monitor on the camera, so maybe that would be your screen. Mm. But yes, you're right, you need at least a mouse and ideally a keyboard You'd to plug, plug into, a it. Pad into it. And you can get little portable ones yeah, to, to plug in, obviously. Look, we, we'll follow up this story and, and give you a heads up as to whether or not we think it's going to be um, any good. Yeah, so um, an S1 2K Mini, uh, I'm trying to find what the sensor is, silicon imaging software to record cineform compressed raw files. Cineform is pretty good mm. uh, in many ratios. Uh, look, I check it out. I don't know what the lens is exactly. I'm sure it's here somewhere. So look, the reality is mm. we've only just started looking looking at this. Um, 2K There's camera, you, to answer the question, 30 frames a second. Yep, it's something you could go and investigate, and we will too. And again, gee, we'd love to have one here in the studio. Yeah. Like, Th this, what I'm looking at there, is from nofilmschool.com. So that's Black Betty. But there's a few of things like this coming out now. The, as I say, the Black Magic's a bit like that, uh, trying to do a lot of all in one. Even the red is a modular camera that does a, it doesn't edit, but you know. Look, I'll just, I'll just tell you, I'm very wary of devices that do absolutely everything. That's a computer. It's an all-in-one box. Yeah, yeah, but but like the the combined thing that is a camera and a recorder and an editor and a microwave oven and makes lunch. One of these things or a tablet. I know a phone does that, but that's like ubiquitous enough. Or <laughs> well, your you tablet just get another there. One. The tablet sort of does that, although it doesn't make lunch. They're not good cameras, but you can edit on that one device after you all. You can. You can. But and you could and you could cook on that. But look, in professional <laughs> terms, I would just say. You can do all this stuff. Mm. Do you really want to? Is that going yeah. to give you the result that you want, particularly for field production? Yeah. The, it gets down to are they dumbing it down so much to try and get everything into the one box and it's not that quite good at every, anything at all? Mm. You know, It's not really anything to anybody. Uh, th this might be a good mid-range solution. Yeah. Uh, but as you say, I'd love hey, to get one in and check it out. You know, like, like prove us wrong. It's just who who, who makes the Black Betty? Send us one Send, and we'll, yeah, we'll test us, it. Tell us why you like it if you've played it. And if anyone's one. had a chance to play with it, yeah, let us know. Yeah. But that's pretty much it for today's show. It's a quick it one. Okay, yeah. so here's the address where you can send your comments. If you want to send us Pick My Brain or contact us generally, uh, email us at veronica at agirlandagun.tv or you can tweet us at a girl and a gun. There we go. Thank you very much, John, as always. Thank we're taking much, a Phil. break for a couple of weeks because we're on term break and we'll be back in about three weeks' time. For now, yeah. that's a wrap. That's it.